What if all the division that may cause a civil war in the United States is caused by a tiny handful of people? I'm Scott Ott, and this is Bill Whittle Now. And Bill, there's a new study out of the Pew Research Center that says 10% of all U.S. adult uh, Twitterers or tweeters uh, post 97% of all the tweets having to do with national politics. In other words, uh, oh, by the way, a smaller subset, the top 6% of adult U.S. tweeters are posting 73% of all the political tweets. And yet Twitter has this reputation as being this very vibrant uh, you know, discourse and a lot of division and uh, uh, arguments over politics. Um, Bill, they also found in the Pew Research study uh, that it's uh, that Twitter is more divided than ever, and that some 72% of those who do post on national uh, politics topics are anti-Trump or opposed or disapprove of President Trump. Um, how does that square with? I know you're not real active on Twitter, but you keep your finger on the pulse. How does that square with your uh, understanding of the world as you see it? Well, my first thought when you told me that uh, 10% of the country was doing 80% of the, you know, uh, complaining about politics, you know, my first thought was busted. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and my second thought was good. Um, well, it's 10% and 97%. It's not even the Pareto oh, sorry, principle. Sorry. It's much more skewed than Pareto. Good, good. The more, the, the, the fewer the people that are making the more noise, the better I feel about the outcome. I don't think it's a good outcome. Um, you know, look, I've, I've never, ever uh, particularly cared for Twitter, and I don't get, I don't, I don't do any um, Twitter activity. And the reason I don't do any Twitter activity is that when I am, I am prone to make a statement uh, right out of the gate on something, and fortunately for me, those usually consist of the only people that hear that are the inside of the shower, or maybe inside of my car, uh, and I think the great. Uh, the, the great danger to Twitter and the damage that Twitter does, and it does a lot of damage, is that it, it allows people to tee off at the moment when they are at most, when they're at peak outrage. And so it becomes this sort of uh, nasty feedback loop where somebody may do something and that will outrage somebody else. And before they have a chance to think it over, calm down, count to 10 or anything like that. They, they send off something that's even more provocative, and that causes another response and so on. So it amps up and hypes up uh, the divisions uh, between uh, the two sides politically in this country. And that's bad. But the fact that so few, that it's such a small percentage of people actually doing it is doing it is, I think, actually extremely good news. Bill, um, I, I think we're breaking some news right here, and I don't want to let it just flow past. Are, are we saying here that a constitutional conservative is publicly now coming out in favor of thoughtful deliberation? Conservatism is predicated on thoughtful deliberation. It's required. The, the entire idea, really, I mean, political conservatism has a number of policy statements and a number of political positions, but those political positions and policy statements are derived from an observation of the world as it is, not as we would like it to be, and the application of principles to minimize the damage, maximize the happiness, and all the while understanding that we're dealing with human beings, human organizations, and human structures that are not only not perfect, they are not perfectible. And, and an attempt to make them perfect always results in, in, uh, in bad things happening. So to say that a conservative is, is open to discussion about something is an oxymoron. We're open to discussion about everything. And, and when somebody makes a better argument than the one I've got in my pocket, I'll change my mind. I'll just steal it. Okay, that makes sense. That's now that's my position now. I've said before, and I think this is important because it certainly is the way I look at things, and I think it's the way that many conservatives look at things, whether they understand it really consciously or not. I'm never wrong, ever. And the reason I'm never wrong is because the second I find out I'm I'm incorrect about something, I move to where the truth is. This is my this is my uh, 
ideal anyway. Bill, that's so getting like, harder and harder these days. And one of the things that the Pew Research study points out is that on social media sites, and specifically they were studying Twitter here, uh, but because of the recommendation engine, so, uh, so to speak, the algorithm that basically says, based on what we know about you, we think you might like, uh, right. what Twitter does is actually push people further and further yep. into the extremes of whatever camp they appear to be in. Absolutely. Uh, based on that, Bill, uh, uh, don't you think we may want to get behind Elizabeth Warren and others who are basically saying... You can just stop right there. No. <laughs> <laughs> now, what I'm saying is that uh, either we have to break up these social media giants or we have to impose a lot more federal control on them because, and, and I know you're a, one of those free speech absolutists, but Bill, when it gets right down to it, we're looking at stuff that many commentators, including yourself, have hinted may result in if not a shooting civil war, at least a kind of modern civil war. Well, that's already here. I don't think there's any question about that. I am, a, as you say, a free, a free speech absolutist and a free speech purist. And so it may seem uh, contradictory when you hear me say things like, I think now Facebook or maybe Twitter has reached the point where they, where they need uh, some kind of government oversight, which I think is the last solution to any problem. But... Let me explain the position. One of the one of the entire supporting precepts of free speech, which in itself supports this entire idea of government, is the idea that your free speech should not be censored. And throughout the history of this country, censorship has always been perceived as the government coming with guns to basically smash up your printing press and make sure that you don't get to say anything. And that's why one of the many reasons why so many people who love freedom are armed because they don't like this idea. So when somebody like Facebook or Twitter comes along, you know, if America, if America finally slides down the hill, the epitaph on the, on the gravestone is going to be died by an algorithm. Um, and so the algorithm the, the, the mathematical formula that determines what you hear and what you don't hear is not only censoring for you already, but the political bias of the people running those platforms is built into those algorithms, and that is censorship. And in fact, it's a worse kind of censorship because it's invisible censorship. The most poignant example of this really, uh, consistently to me anyway, is uh, several years ago, I caught up with my friend uh, Afonso Rachel. I said, how you doing? He said, fine. I said, you've been all right? He said, what do you mean? I, said, I haven't heard from you for a while. He says, no one has heard from me for a while. No one. I put out these videos all the time and no one gets them. No one. And I realized that Alfonso Rachel had been like insisted it, 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 as in, inside of a cyst. And, and that the way that the left is protecting the damage that Rachel uh, does to that uh, philosophy is to is to surround him by a bubble of 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 being ignored, and and the worst thing about that is that not only does it make his friends and, and his fans think he's he's basically out of the game, but when you realize that you're on the inside of this trying to break out of this bubble, and and certainly this is true for us. We never did we never did a firewall in this company prior to a year or two ago. That we never did less than two three hundred thousand views ever. And now they're ten percent of that, and and the effect of it is to make you want to basically just give it up. It's like oh, so you know, so twenty thousand people are going to see this. Now on the other side of that, I mean, you're talking about the kind of shutting down speech, and frankly, the most recent episode of Bill Whittle Now, the one we recorded right before this one, was immediately shut down by YouTube's algorithm when it comes to monetization, and that is was, as we record this is under review. This happens on a regular basis. Sometimes almost they, everyone they just automatically take there are turn a lot the money of them. Off. Yeah, and I would I would say a good thirty to fifty percent of them they immediately shut down, and then they go through a review process, and many of them, if not most of them, they restore, but it's after the initial rush of uh, views comes through, and so it really minimizes the revenue that comes from the monetization uh, process. Just as a quick, just as a quick, kind of semi-legal observation on that. Not legal so much as just moral. While the video is under review, are the commercials pulled from the video? That I don't know because I watch I our videos not. multiple times, but it's usually before we post them. Okay. All right. But your point is, is that if they were to just, for example, blanket, uh, deny, demonetize every single conservative video, and if it took 
24 hours for them to say, you know what, geez, okay, you're right. There's nothing in here particularly offensive. They've cut 95% of our revenue because most of that comes within the first day of, of posting. Yeah, and they'll say it's not appropriate for most advertisers and they and they shut it down. Um, but b the opposite of that, the opposite of being shut down is the multiplication of the distribution of, uh, of inflammatory tweets, for example, back to the Pew Research study, uh, because in that process of upvoting and sharing things uh, with your friends, it's a snowball effect. And because of that, Bill, because there's a compound interest kind of phenomenon going yep. on with this whole thing, it ripples out through your whole multi-level marketing organization. Yep. Um, how can conservatives in particular and, and Americans in general guard themselves against being compound interest tools of malign characters and even Russian government sources? <laughs> well, they can't. And, and since this is, I think at this point, beyond any reasonable doubt, uh, something that is actively in place and making significant uh, negative impact on conservatives while conversely uh, significantly promoting the, the viewpoint of, of the left, that then removes these social media companies from their defense as carriers. Twi well, well, uh, well, let me correct you for a second there, because the accusation really is that a lot of pro-Trump content, uh, content that was produced by the GRU or by these these uh, you know tweet farms, basically uh, somewhere in Russia, um, that stuff gets amplified and recirculated by decent human uh, Americans, not bots, by people who uh, believe that, hey, this is something that syncs with my viewpoint, so I'm going to amplify it. And it's really, uh, they're being used because they're Trump supporters, they're being used by Russians to sow discord in the United States. Right. And, the, and, and, and what is the essential assumption behind that accusation? The, w when people make that accusation, what they're basically saying is two things. First of all, if you voted for Trump, you're the kind of person who will re retweet something like my favorite National Enquirer headline was B-17 bomber found on moon. Uh, and, and, and so the first assumption in that is that these simple hayseeds and rubes out there in flyover country who are so, so, so stupid and naive will retreat, will, will we <laughs> retweet any fiction that the Russians make particularly come up to. And therefore, uh, the great danger to our democracy is that the Russians, who are very smart, are going to send out messages that are going to be swallowed up by the American people that are very stupid, without question, without any kind of well, critical I don't think you have analysis. to be an idiot, Bill, but I think you could be a busy it person. Helps. I think you could be a busy person who sees a headline, assumes it's legit, and circulates it. But this is, but this is the entire... This is my entire point about the 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 supposition is that is that somehow the Russians are are selectively picking news items and pumping them out to the conservative population as if the American mainstream media was doing nothing but absolutely unbiased, uh, uh, you know, uh, trumpeting of the facts that the, if if. If these headlines get more traction than perhaps they deserve, it's only because the left is doing what the uh, what the illusionary Russians are doing on a daily basis. They're telling people what they want them to hear and the things that they should be hearing because it's news they suppress. So, so that whole thing, if it's to the degree that it exists, that when I I'm not when I say to the degree that it exists, I don't mean to the degree that the effect is present. I mean to the degree that the effect actually influences reality uh, and and the main thing behind this Scott is not just that is not just that uh, Trump voters are stupid and will believe anything the main thing is by making this argument once again once again the 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 party of the of the bawling infants once again is saying that the election was illegitimate that the election was caused by foreign agents who threw the election and these stupid, stupid, stupid Americans out there in flyover country who bought these outrageous lies about Hillary Clinton and her email server and all the rest of this invented stuff. Well, that's what cost Hillary the, the natural election. And what it is, is it's an ongoing attempt by people who have some very, very serious emotional issues to find any possible reason to explain why they lost. 
and and the idea that the American people do not want their what they're selling is not only not uh, popular with them, it's inconceivable. And so something has to explain it. Something has to explain. But Bill, you yourself have claimed that uh, conservatives in general are decent, trusting people and, right. do, and, and therefore more susceptible to being duped by nasty individuals who would use their trusting nature against them. Well, fortunately, for, uh, and that's absolutely true, uh, it's absolutely true, um, decent people are often um, easily uh, duped by people because in many cases, really decent people simply cannot imagine that somebody would do something as, as horrible as just plain lie to your face. So it is true, I think, that that, that, that tends to make conservatives a bit more... Um, a bit more, a bit more uh, impaired when it comes to seeing that this is like an obvious lie or a manipulation. But on the other side of this balance is the fact that conservatives are far better informed than progressives, far better about virtually everything. And this this is backed up by a fair amount of research as well. Their their positions are 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 much more rooted in reality, if for no other reason than the fact that a conservative has to swim in an environment of liberal messaging every single day, every minute of the day. And if you manage to hold on to conservative principles in the face of that, it's because you have thought about it enough so that you are willing to swim against this cultural stream, which has enormous, enormous psychological pressures behind it. So not only does that make the average conservative, active conservative, you know, political uh person of political interest, not only does it make them better informed, it, it makes them um, tougher. They're more fit in the sense that if, that salmon have to swim upstream for, you know, 50 miles and a log can just get float, float all its way down to the sea. And once the salmon gets there, she dies. Um, so, Bill, this is what I'd like to finish. This she makes episode. more salmon, though. That's true. More salmon are produced. Um, I'd like to finish up with a, a different survey. This is done by an organization called the Campaign for Free Speech. And they have found that nearly 60% of millennials, and they're bracketing that as between the ages of 21 and 38, nearly 60% of millennials agreed with uh, this statement that the Constitution, quote, goes too far in allowing hate speech in modern America and that it should be rewritten. They also, 60% uh, of them also think there's a little too much free press in this country as well. Uh, Bill, whether you mm -hmm. like that or not, there's a generation coming up behind yours that has a much different view of that free speech absolutism than you do. Does that make you a little concerned? It definitely does. What was that first number? 60% uh, of millennials agree that the Constitution goes too far in allowing hate speech in modern America. That is about as alarming as anything that's on the table right now. Um, and I think the best way to combat it is to go after the language, not to go after the argument and certainly not to go after the specifics, to go after the language. Because what they're saying is, well, without question, it is a it is a catastrophe for for the entire ideals of this country, which they have been specifically excluded from, by the way. So it's not really their fault. But what they're basically saying is, if you define if you define conservatism as hate speech, as speech designed to um, to uh, humiliate people and to incite other people to violence against them, then what they are saying by saying that we should put more limits on hate speech is a misguided but an authentic attempt on their part to be to be virtuous. What they're basically saying is it's not right that people should be able to bully people and 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 incite um you know these red hat wearing uh lunatics to come and beat up gays on on every corner. And that's what's driving that. But the fact of the matter is that's this is a precise inverse of what actually happens in the world. And this is the power of being able to sit on the message. The, I would go at this by saying, okay, so what's the definition of hate speech? And then, and then ask them to define it. And they'd probably come up with a pretty good reasonable definition of it. And then I would simply say, well, pretty much everything that you've said about me by the rules that you've just laid out is hate speech towards my position. Does that mean we need to shut you up too?
And and the best way I think to convince millennials or anybody else for that matter of of the uh, of the fallacy of the position they may be in is is to point out their own behavior in it, not to rub their nose in the hypocrisy of it. That's actually a mistake, but to simply say that look, you say one thing and you're doing something else, and the thing that you're doing is much better than the thing that you're thinking. In other words, you're trying to protect people from, from being intimidated and bullied and stuff. And that's a noble goal. But the cost of doing that is the cost of having one person or one ideology decide what can be said and what can't drives you right back to the foundation of the free speech argument, which again, I don't want to overtell this story, but my dad went to Germany. He got to, uh, into Germany in April of 45. He got there in the last week or two of the war. He didn't see any combat or anything, but he had a profound uh uh, profound hatred of Nazis. And when, as a young man, I, as a kid, really as a boy, I saw the, the Nazis marching through the streets of Skokie, I thought my dad was going to be the person to say, you know, we got to just get, arrest all these people. And for the kids really, watching this today, Skokie is a town in Illinois in the United States. Yes, an American town where the American Nazi party, which was much stronger then than it is now, decided they were going to have a march and the town allowed it which was an indication that back in those days, the town understood the principles that this country was based on. And so the question then becomes, do people who genuinely are hateful, who are genuinely um, willing to uh, openly call for, if not the murder, then certainly the political uh, you know, stripping of the rights of, of entire ethnic groups just based on, on the ethnic group. So the question is, do the Nazis have a right to march through downtown Skokie, Illinois? And I for sure my dad was going to say no because of his hatred for the ideology. And he didn't say no. He said, he said no, they need to be allowed to do it. I could have knocked me over with a feather. And I said, how can you say that? And he said, because because if somebody has the right to say that you can't do this, then it all comes down to the fact that somebody is deciding what you can say and what you can't say. And that doesn't end well. It is disgusting and disgraceful to see American Nazis marching through the streets of an American city. It's disgusting and disgraceful, but it is the byproduct of the most liberating, wonderful, freeing, and uh, and morally good concept that's ever graced human society. And that is, it's the price you pay for not having anybody able to say, you can't say that here. And that's the argument. And so, and so once again, we come up against this progressive idea of perfection, like, like there's some sort of magical filter, like angels will sit there with, you know, with, with, with check uh, lists on, on clipboards and, and say, no, actually that's kind of harmful, but, but you can rephrase it. No, somebody would be, some person would be making a decision about what you can say and what you cannot say. And that is the road to tyranny and murder and death and, and all of it, because People like that and people like the millennials who are coming up with that 60% number think it's possible. They think it's possible to have your cake and eat it too. In other words, to be able to say anything you want to, but the stuff that's actually genuinely hurting people's feelings, we're, we're going to we're gonna have to shut that down. Nobody is in favor, well, I'm not certainly, of, of saying things that hurt people's feelings, but that doesn't stop me from saying things that hurt people's feelings because no matter what I say, no matter what I say, it's going to hurt somebody's feelings. The very first time I had to deal with this issue was when I started writing Eject, Eject, Eject. And, um, and my girlfriend at the time said, uh, Bill, do you really have to be so, you know, like vocal about this? Can't you kind of tone it down? There's a lot of people out there, you know, you know, really kind of upset about, about some of the things you wrote. And she was worried about my safety. And I said, I said, honey, if, look, if I write, if I write an, an article talking about how apple pie is the most wonderful dessert ever. Within three minutes, somebody's going to be tweeting that, um, that the cherry pie people are going to be calling me a Nazi, right? The cherry pie people will be up in arms. And so you cannot have it both ways. And this kind of thing of being able to say to a, a progressive, okay, well, tell me what you think uh, is not hate speech and have them list off a bunch of things that I say, well, I find that hateful and I find that hateful and I find that hateful. Now, you can't say those things anymore. Well, what do you mean? Well, no, you can't say them anymore because they offend me. Then they will start to say, well, it should, you know, this isn't offensive. Ah, so you're deciding that I cannot be offended by the things that you say, but you can be offended by the things that I say. And therefore, I need to be forced to shut up, but you're protected because your opinion 
and your person, your actual physical being is important and worth something. And my human life and my human opinions are not only are not only useless, they're criminal. Is that what you're saying? Producing some of the best conversations on the topic of free speech to ever be demonetized on YouTube. This is <laughs> Bill Whittle now, and it is We're made number possible one. We're number one. <laughs> by the members at BillWhittle.com, <laughs> who, uh, if not for their contributions, this wouldn't be happening. And they've been supporting us for a long time. Their ranks have been growing. We invite you to join them. If you are a free speech absolutist or purist, as Bill describes, um, or even if you have some qualms about free speech, it would be nice to receive uh, some of the free speech that you're not getting elsewhere by joining and becoming a member. If you're not a member at BillWhittle.com, you can actually go to the website and watch a lot of the videos here. You just won't be able to access the backstage content, the comments section, the forums, the member written blog, the private messaging, and a number of other features that the members enjoy. But the main thing that members do for us is make it possible for us to distribute these messages around the world. And for them, we're grateful. For Bill Whittle, I'm Scott Ott. Thanks for watching.